watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. Yay! Nestled in the Farmington Valley of Simsbury, Connecticut, is a family-operated farm that has been running continuously for 90 years. I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. And tonight's episode is part two of my Connecticut Fed series. Come with me while I discover the secret to Rosedale Farms' success. So I'm here with Marshall Epstein, the owner of Rosedale Farms. Thanks for having us out here. Our pleasure. <laughs> So you've been continuously operating for 90 years yes. in your family. Quick so 90 years, it seems. A quick 90 years. You don't look that old. No, I'm, I'm not, no, no. <laughs> no, so, not quite. So what has helped you to keep the farm going and running? What's, what's the secret to your success? Probably the, the willingness and, and the ability to change with the times. Um, like everything in, in agriculture and every other business today in the United States, you really have to adapt to some kind of change. And originally in 1920, it was a dairy farm and tobacco, and we had chickens. And through the years, we evolved. My dad was one of the first ones that really had like a truck farm. The terminology you hear kind of like in New Jersey, where a variety of different vegetables. But over the years, we've changed with mm -hmm. that. Um, we were able to buy more land. The original farm was only 42 acres. Now it's 110, all contiguous, and it goes from back this way all the way to, all the way down the end of the road to Riverside Road. Uh, we're fortunate we have two ponds, and we also have the river, so it's a great landscape. And now, I really, it's evolved. Um, I was a third generation, and my daughter, Lisa, who teaches in Hartford, um, her husband has taken on with me, and now he's, will be the, I guess, they're the fourth He'll generation. The fourth generation. Now, you also, you're experimenting with the hydroponics, which we can yes. see the greenhouse yes. across to the Our right. Money so pit. tell me a little bit, your money pit. Oh, no. Everybody has a money pit. Oh, no. 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 Uh, again, one it's of the things. It's an thing, investment, right? Yeah, no, the, one of the difficult things is that our farming agriculture, really, the first time we really start making money is in June and it ends November, December, you go six months without any income flow. Uh, so one of the things that we thought would be interesting is to, again, cutting edge, one of the, I don't think anybody really is doing hydroponics at this level. So we'll be growing uh, lettuces, tomatoes, um, a variety of different things, eventually, you know, strawberries, even maybe some fish in there. So trying fish. to, yeah, so wow. maybe trout and some other things. So, uh, you know, continuing the, you so know, what the we leading edge do. of the like, change. Yes, because yeah. they're huge. I mean, Parts right. of Canada and, and overseas in Europe, Israel, hydroponics are huge. Uh, it's a very effective way of, of, of farming. Now you have a membership which you're getting ready to distribute right. your first membership today. Yep. yep. Um, now is all of that from your farm or is it you, you kind of fill in bits and pieces? Yeah, ours is a little different than some CSAs. Uh -huh. uh, we make it representation type of what we do at the farm. Okay. So, but most of the things are, you know, what we grow, mm -hmm. and we complement that. Or with Connecticut, we use Belltown uh, peaches and apples sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do fun things. We'll do, for example, we grow peaches, and we offer salsa. So, uh, Mr. Kane will use our peaches and make a neat peach salsa. So you might get salsa and chips. That's the uh, salsa loco company. Yes. 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 So we try to do things. Yeah, very good. So That's we try so to good. make it fun, <laughs> fanciful. Right. I mean, and, and a little more than what you might expect. A lot of you know different goodies, mm -hmm. uh, and mostly local, of course. And throughout the summer, you said you have events. You have the Chef to Farm. At the end of the summer, you have the corn maze and the pumpkins. But you have right. a few festivals, don't you? Yeah, one of the other things that we, what people really enjoyed last year, we do a farm fest. Mm -hmm. And every month will be a different theme. Uh, we also partner with, uh, with Max's and that also. And Max also brings in uh, Thomas Hooker beer. And actually, they're highlighting this year. Uh, we have a watermelon patch that uh, probably about the first week of July we'll start providing. Uh, fresh watermelon and so one of the new products they have for this this year is watermelon beer so with the Rosedale beer. Great. yeah so that'd be kind of cool kind of funky that sounds like uh, our next stop yeah next stop yeah <laughs> guy Kurt Good Cameron, to Kurt Cameron a great guy uh, so you know we try to you know brand and use our products in different ways I mean that's that's part of what makes it kind of neat I think 90% of the things that we sell in the store other than maybe some Vermont cheese and maybe a few other products that are unique that people keep asking for mm -hmm. um, are all Connecticut. Marshall
Marshall later introduced me to his winemaker, Charlie Stevenson, to discover the secrets behind their award-winning wines. Marshall's wife, Lynn, and his sister, Sandra Bork, are standing between Marshall and Charlie. It is truly a family-run farm. One of the exciting things was when Marshall first started, Marshall and Lynn started talking to us about uh, getting involved with vineyards. And I asked him, why in the world would he want to do that? Uh, because he was so good at what he did. Uh, and his comment, I'll never forget, he said, listen, I, I, we grow probably the best tasting corn and vegetables in the valley, if not all of Connecticut. And I don't, don't see why I can't do the very best grapes in Connecticut. And in fact, he does that with the help of his son-in-law, John Kozlowski, who's my partner in virtually all of the aspects of the winery. Um, John brings in every year just an absolutely beautiful crop. When you walk through the vineyards and, and you look at them, I don't think you'll find a more beautiful, healthy vineyard anywhere in Connecticut. We do six wines, uh, plus we do a late fall, or early fall release, which would be a seventh wine. But our basic flagships are six wines. We do um, three whites. We do a raspberry infusion, which is, looks like a rosé, and then we do two red wines. Um, the fun thing for us is that, that, that all of our white wines are basically 100% uh, grapes grown here in the valley right here at the farm. So uh, when you taste these wines, you're really tasting the terroir of, of Simsbury and the Farmington River Valley, which we're very excited about. Uh, the small vineyard, um, the vineyard end of the operation does less than a thousand cases a year. Uh, but, uh, uh, we, and it's all very much handmade. Uh, we call it handcrafted wine and it truly is. It's all done virtually one bottle at a time. But uh, we have a lot of fun doing it and um, it's been a real experience for all of us. Everything is processed here. We do 100% of the work here. The, the fresh grapes come in from the field. They're all crushed, they're processed, they're fermented. Um, we have all of the tanks, we have all of the equipment here. Then we go through the winter with the various fining and settling out processes. Uh, in the spring, we run them through filtration. Uh, we're currently now bottling the 2009 vintage. Uh, so that, that that's what all of these bottles are, with the exception of the Malbec, which is um, we did last year in the fall. Um, then mentioned that, that, that it was a Chilean product uh, because Chile is six months apart from us. It allows us to have some fun and do a wine that we would have, wouldn't have room for otherwise because our tanks are empty from, from getting moving on all of the other products. So what is your favorite? Go down the line. Favorite wine? Uh, Lou's Red. <laughs> Simsbury Celebration. <laughs> I like Celebration as well. I love all my children. <laughs> <laughs> you can't pick a favorite child. <laughs> I love That's it. cute. That's Rosedale's Chef to Farm Dinners was an event I wasn't going to miss. As you arrive at the event, you are greeted with soothing music and a glass of Rosedale wine. Then you are invited to enjoy a hayride winding its way through Rosedale's fields. Along the way, Marshall shares with you his passion for his farm. Finally, you arrive in the middle of a lush field where the Max's group is ready to wow you with a divine four-course, locally grown gourmet meal. The menu is, is um, really dedicated to the farmer, and uh, especially the farmer here at Rosedale and farmers within 30 miles of Rosedale, maybe 40. 99.9% um, .9 of the menu that we're serving tonight is from the state of Connecticut. Um, we're representing dairy um, with some cheeses from Cato Corners and Colchester, Beltane Farms um, in Lebanon. Uh, we have shellfish from uh, Brantford um, and Stonington, and uh, we have just a variety of produce. As I said, the majority of it coming from right here at Rosedale and a few other smaller farms throughout the state. It's a good opportunity, as Scott mentioned, and we're trying to do is, is you know, get people to really appreciate what's local, um, what's in their own backyard and in the greater Hartford area and beyond, really. We get people from even the Fairfield County sometimes who find out what, what we have here. And you're right, uh, we have usually a tour of the farm, uh, so people can kind of learn what we do, what our operation is about. Uh, also, as, as Scott mentioned, the menu is really, you get the showcase, and it's kind of neat because their creativity is it's, it's so incredible. I mean, I just am astonished sometimes and amazed by what they create from what we grow and what the finished product is. And, um, it's just a great opportunity for us to really get people out here. That's probably the main thing is to really appreciate what we do. The challenge is in, is in, uh, in our hands, really. It's waiting um, patiently um, for Marshall and, and John um, and some of our other friends to call us and say, hey, we're here, we're ready to go. And uh, once that happens, it it's, uh, doesn't take a genius to put together a menu like this. It's just putting great ingredients together on a plate. And um, 
you know, today, um, you know, being the middle of June, is it the middle of June? Yes. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, being the middle of June, you know, we were, we have some squash, uh, squash blossoms, blossoms uh, peas, strawberries, um, some pea tendrils from, from the peas. So, um, you know, that's just from this farm alone. And we have some other, uh, as I said, farmers growing some great stuff. So um, it's just week by week going throughout the season. You know, we really go um, head, head first into this uh, right around June 1st. And uh, within all of our restaurants in the Max Group, um, our, our produce goes from, you know, 20, 30 percent local to at my restaurant close to 90 percent uh, local and supporting uh, the farmer as much as possible. And, and um, you know, week by week it changes. So we have uh, these dinners planned through the middle of September and we're going to go from strawberry season into, into tomato season, into corn season. And, uh, and as I just said, it's just it's, it's, it's easy for us when we have such great ingredients. After spending the day with Marshall and experiencing the Chef to Farm dinner, I knew the secret to Rosedale's success. Hosting fantastic events, implementing cutting edge technologies, partnering with other Connecticut farmers, and of course, loving what they do, growing delicious produce. Now, stay tuned while I bring some of that farm fresh produce to my own table. Now, when I was at a Rosedale Farms, I had um, talked about the farm share that I signed up for. And I got my first shipment of my farm share, and I got a beautiful, beautiful assortment of all different produce, um, fruits, vegetables. I even got a little mini blueberry pie, which was so delicious. Um, but one of the things that is bountiful in summer, and I actually didn't even plant it in my garden because I knew there would be plenty available, and my family is actually not huge fans of, is um, zucchini and summer squash. So you can see here um, that I, in my first chair, got some zucchini and summer squash. So I thought, you know, maybe there's something different that I can do with it. Well, coincidentally, I have a subscription to Real Simple. And in this month, um, in the June edition of Real Simple, there's a whole um, article on farm to table um, recipes that you can do. And one of them is for mix pan fried fish with squash salsa. So I have never made this before, and I thought, why not try it on TV? I tend to do that when I invite friends over for dinner. Um, that's when I experiment. I try new things. So why not do it on TV? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the squash salsa. And what that requires is one medium zucchini. This is probably a little bit bigger than a medium zucchini. Um, but you know, zucchini, they just grow like weeds. So um, we're going to cut the zucchini up into a small dice. Okay, so I have cut the zucchini, all the zucchini up into small dice. So there's the zucchini. We're going to do the same thing with um, a medium yellow squash. Uh, these seem a little bit smaller than medium, but that's okay. We'll do the same thing with the squash. And I think cutting it in half makes it a little bit easier to manage because it doesn't roll all over the place when you're cutting it up. So those are the main two main ingredients are squash, summer squash, yellow squash, and zucchini. And I imagine you could use any squash. You, I'm growing some patty pan in my um, garden, so you could do patty pan. And then you need to, it calls for a yellow pepper. Well, I didn't have a yellow pepper, I had an orange pepper, so I figured that was okay. So I'm just going to cut up my orange pepper here. When I'm cutting the peppers, again, we're trying to have salsa size because it's going to be cooked for salsa. So we're going to cut this into a small salsa sized dice. And um, peppers aren't quite in season yet. So these are just from the grocery store, not local, probably Canada, maybe Mexico. I think we have another month or so to go before. Um, peppers are available. So I'm just going to leave the peppers right there. Okay, so that's, so now we have our one zucchini, one squash, peppers, and then I've already diced um, a small red onion. 
And now I'm going to heat the stove and cook it up. So I have preheated a pan with one tablespoon of olive oil in it. And then you just toss in the onions, you put in the squash, you put in the zucchini, and you put in the peppers. It's beautiful, it's like a rainbow. The rainbow of colors. Okay, put your rainbow in and then you put in um, half of a teaspoon of pepper. I'm just gonna do a little shake of pepper. And half of a teaspoon of salt. I'm gonna do a couple big pinches of salt. And then you saute it for two to three minutes on the stove. And I don't know if you can hear it sizzling or not, but you just want the vegetables to be uh, soft, not overly mushy. So once it's done cooking, you just very carefully transfer the vegetables onto a plate and put it in the refrigerator to cool. And while it's cooling, you move on to part two of the recipe. So what you're going to put the salsa on is the recipe calls for catfish, which is an experiment for me as well. I've never had catfish. Um, but you season the catfish with salt and pepper on either side. That's all you do. No breading, nothing, just salt and pepper. And then you preheat two tablespoons of olive oil in the um, skillet. And then you fry it just until it's opaque. So it's fried catfish, just like you were in the south. Okay, so once the catfish is done, which it looks like it's just about done, you take it off the, put it on the plate. Now I'm going to keep this warm with a piece of tin foil while I fix the rest of the salsa. I'm going to keep that warm back here next to the hot pan. And I'm going to go get my veggies and finish the salsa. Okay, so I've taken my vegetables out of the freezer and put them in a bowl and then what I'm going to do is toss them with a the vinaigrette. So what that is is it is a tablespoon of chopped parsley and my trick for chopping parsley is you, I use flat leaf um, and this is again from my garden which is very exciting. Cook with stuff from my garden. I just cut the leaves and just cut them in little pieces. I find it so much easier than a knife. So much easier. So a tablespoon of the parsley. A tablespoon of chopped parsley. Okay, and then the same thing with the basil. Just cut them with, cut them with the kitchen shears. You can even cut them more once they're in the bowl. So a tablespoon of chopped basil. Okay, and then we're going to do equal parts of um, red wine vinegar. So two tablespoons of red wine vinegar. There's one. There's two. And then my olive oil back from the catfish. Two tablespoons of olive oil. One, two. And a dash of salt. A little dash of pepper, and just mix it all up. Oops, I mixed too strong. I went flying out of the bowl. I'm just going to mix it up. Looks really nice, actually. Very colorful. And then I'm going to plate it up with the catfish. Look at that. You can't get much better than that. One of my favorite summer recipes is using fresh picked corn to make a gorgeous corn salad. So usually what I do is when I'm planning on having corn on the cob for a meal, then I get extra corn and I cook it all together and then I put in the refrigerator the corn that we don't eat and I make corn salad for the next night's dinner. So here I have my extra corn on the cob. Um, yesterday we celebrated my father's birthday. And so I got lots and lots of corn on the cob. And so this is left over because I was planning on making some corn salad. So you need um, cooked corn from, fresh from the cob, although you could in a pinch use um, frozen corn, but it's definitely the best if you use um, local fresh cooked corn on the cob. You need basil, 
Um, you need some red onion, some basil, some red onion, and then olive oil, red wine vinegar, kosher salt, and fresh ground black pepper. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to chop up a half a cup of red onion. And you could do this in a food processor. I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. And then cut it across. Just a nice small dice, size that you would want to have in your salad. You don't want pieces to be too big. And red, red onion is really nice and mild. So that's perfect for your cold salad. You don't cook the onion or anything. You just chop it raw. So that's a half a cup of red onion. And then I'm going to pre-do my basil. And in the recipe, I should mention that this recipe is from Barefoot Contessa, which is, I have all of her books. I love Barefoot Contessa. She has some absolutely fabulous recipes. Um, so it is from the original, the Barefoot Contessa cookbook. And it is on page 101, Fresh Corn Salad. So to prepare the basil, I've already washed the leaves. And this basil is um, from my garden. And it's growing like mad. It's the weather has been fantastic for my garden. And a little trick is I use kitchen scissors. Um, it just makes it so much easier than trying to struggle with a knife. So you just kind of layer, layer the basil on top of each other. Just kind of make a stack of basil leaves. And then you just cut it into strips. Chiffonade means strips. And these are really big basil leaves. My, I'm telling you, my basil plant, I put it in my garden because I love basil, but also it's a good um, anti-bug. The bugs don't like the smell, so it's a good companion herb. And it is all of a sudden just going crazy. I had a huge bush of it, and so I cut a bunch of it um, for my salad. And so then you need a half a cup of the basil. Okay, so now we have our basil and we have our onions. Half a cup of red onions, half a cup of basil. And now, to get the fresh corn off of the cob, what you want to do is you just, now this has been refrigerated, so it was cooked, refrigerated overnight, so it's cold. Um, you just want a very, you know, sharp knife. You want to carefully hold your ear up like this, the corn ear, and you just very gently cut the corn off the cob. And it comes off in kind of these neat rows and it's pretty simple my girls actually one of my daughters loves corn on the cob actually on the cob and my other daughter doesn't really like the way the corn gets stuck in her teeth um, so I will frequently just when we have corn on the cob I will cut the corn off the cob so she still gets the delicious fresh local corn but it is not going to stick in her teeth when she munches down on the cob. So um, the Barefoot Contessa's recipe calls for about five ears. And some of these ears are small. This is early corn. I just got, I got this in June. It's, it's the end of June um, when I'm filming this. And so the ears are a little bit small. So you can kind of take a guesstimate about how much corn you want. So that, I have about four ears. I'm going to do one more. And this corn is not from my farm yet, which is Rosedale, where I have a share, but it is local. I think it's from a farm in South Windsor. So you know summer's here when fresh local corn on the cob appears <clears throat> at the farm stand. So this corn is going to go into my bowl. And it's still kind of in rows. Um, I don't know if you can see that, that that's kind of, they're still kind of in chunky pieces, but that'll fall apart once you start mixing it up with the dressing. Okay, so now I'm going to mix up my dressing. So when I mix up the dressing, I'm going to have three tablespoons of olive oil, which I've already poured, and then three tablespoons of red wine vinegar. So equal olive oil, equal red vinegar, red wine vinegar. One, two, Glug, 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 three. And then you have a half of a teaspoon of fresh ground pepper. I've already ground some. I'll grind a little bit more. Uh, half a teaspoon, oops, that's a teaspoon. Half a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of pepper, fresh ground pepper. 
half a teaspoon of kosher salt. At Barefoot Contessa always um, uses kosher salt. And I'm sure there's a reason. Maybe it's just a little bit um, more flavorful. It's not quite so refined. So it's a half a teaspoon of pepper, half a teaspoon of kosher salt. We mix it all together. Okay. And then we are going to take our yummy, yummy corn. We're going to add half a cup of the basil leaves chiffonade, half a cup of the red onions chopped to a nice small dice. And then I'm going to drizzle the olive oil vinaigrette mixture on top of it. And then I'm just going to mix it. And it's, it's colorful. It has the red onions. It has the corn. It has the basil, fresh basil. You can't beat it. Mm, so delicious. Mm, I can just smell the basil and the fresh picked corn and, and the onions. It's wonderful. I can't wait to serve it for dinner. So stay tuned. I'm going to be back with some of my picks of locally produced products um, that I have found on my journey through my Connecticut Fed project. So I'm back and I want to share with you some of the products that I've found that are locally made, not necessarily grown, but made with uh, local products, some cheeses, some various things. And you can really be entertain, have a dinner with all locally made food, have your own farm to table um, gathering. You can make the catfish with the locally grown salsa on top for the main course. You can serve it with a side of corn. Um, corn salad that you made with fresh picked corn and basil from your garden. You can start with appetizers. Um, my favorite find so far is from the Salsa Loca company. Uh, they have fantastic corn chips. The blue ones are my favorite. And then they have all sorts of varieties of salsa. They also do uh, varieties depending on what's in season. So Marshall from Rosedale had mentioned that they do a um, peach salsa when peaches are in season. So check them out. Definitely worth a try. So you can start your evening out with chips and salsa or if you're a cheese fan like I am, you can get cheese from the Granville Cheese, cheese Country Store. Um, this is a cheddar. I got this at the Rosedale Farm Stand and you can get it at other locations. Served this at a ladies uh, gathering I had at my house and it was fantastic. People chose this over um, the blueberry cake I had made. There is also um, goat cheese from Sweet Pea uh, Goat Farm out in uh, Granby. And you can do all sorts of things with goat cheese. You can put it in a salad. You can put it on crackers for an appetizer. You can cook it in eggs. It's fantastic. And this is, um, I've gotten this several times and it's always, always delicious. Um, of course, you can always start your guests off with a glass of locally made wine from Rosedale Vineyard. Um, I had an opportunity to taste a few of their varieties and they were all quite good. Um, my husband and I, I think, are going to plan on doing the wine, Connecticut Wine Trail in August when our girls are um, at sleepaway camp. So I will report on that more when I come back in the fall for our, my next new episode. And finally, you can also add another salad to your entertaining menu. Um, I have found a local uh, mozzarella cheese company. Um, Luisi cheese and this is really good local mozzarella cheese. They are based in Hamden, Connecticut, but they also have a store in New Haven with a whole variety of cheeses. And what's better than a mozzarella, local mozzarella, basil from your garden, local grown tomatoes, maybe tomatoes from your garden, um, salad. Fantastic. So you can really plan to have a whole meal. Bring, invite people in and see what you can do to have an entirely farm to table um, meal with your guests. I would love to hear some of your suggestions if you've done that, what recipes were successful. Um, again, you can go to sarahconnor.net, um, see what I'm doing on my blog. You can also go to my Facebook page, Sarah Connor, and give some of your suggestions of fantastic things that you can bring to the table that are sourced right here from our own Connecticut. Next month, August, is a hiatus month for the station, but I will be back with a brand new episode of Life and Style with Sarah, my concluding episode of Connecticut Fed in September. Thanks for watching. <laughs>